Shortly after midnight on June 6, 1944, the sleepy town of Benouville in Normandy would witness the opening of D-Day. British airborne troops would capture the vital bridges over the Caen Canal and the Orne River. It was here that the first Allied soldiers would land on D-Day. It was here where the first house in France would be liberated. And it was here where the first Allied soldier would be killed by enemy fire. Describing the operation, Air Chief Marshal Lee Mallory would say, it was one of the most outstanding flying achievements of the war. In the early hours of D-Day, British 6th Airborne Division would be dropped to the east of Salt Beach. Their objective was to secure the easternmost flank of the invasion beaches and to link up with the forces that would be coming ashore. Critical to this plan, it was vital that the bridges on the Orne River and Carl Canal would be captured intact. The bridges lay between the towns of Benouville and Ronville. The bridge over the Carl Canal, the Pont de Benneville, would be given the code name Pegasus. And the bridge over the River Orne, the Pont de Ronville, would be given the code name Orsa. The small town of Benneville sits alongside the Carl Canal, an important maritime gateway into the city of Caen. Spanning the Carl Canal is the distinctive and recognisable Basquiat-style bridge. The bridge we see here is a more recent version, replacing the former bridge in 1994. But it's very similar to the old bridge, retaining a lot of the characteristics. The original bridge is now located just a short distance away in the grounds of the Memorial Pegasus Museum. Another iconic building is the Café Gondre. Linked indelibly to the Pegasus Bridge story, the café was the first house to be liberated in France on D-Day. In 1944, the café was run by Georges and Thérèse Gondry, seen here with their children, Georgette and Arlette. They bought the café in 1934, around the time that the Basquiat Bridge was constructed. This is how the café looked before the Gondrys took over. Alongside the cafe ran a tram line which took passengers from Caen to Wistriham and opposite the cafe was the tram stop. Behind the tram stop was another cafe, the Café Pico. This is now the site of the Café Le Trois Planeurs. Tragically the owner Louis Pico was killed in the early hours of the 6th of June during the capture of Pegasus Bridge. The forces chosen to capture the bridges were led by this man, Major John Howard. Major Howard commanded D Company of the 2nd Oxford and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry, or Ox and Bucks for short. 
The 2nd Oxen Bucks were part of the 6th Air Landing Brigade of the 6th Airborne Division. These were specialist glider infantry. The Horsa Glider was a large, powerless aircraft. Constructed of wood, it was capable of carrying both men and equipment. The Horsa Glider could carry 30 men fully loaded. It had the advantage of being able to drop those men directly onto a target. The Kudaman force consisted of 181 men and 6 gliders. It was a mix of oxen bucks, army medics and royal engineers. Major Howard had detailed intelligence about the defences on the bridges. Aerial reconnaissance photos revealed extensive trench systems, barbed wire, a pillbox, MG34 positions, and also a 5cm anti-tank gun. Pegasus Bridge had also been prepared for demolition by the Germans. This important intelligence found its way to the British via the local French resistance. One key source for the resistance was Madame Léa Vion. Madame Vion was the director of the maternity hospital at the Château de Bonneville. In a role at the maternity hospital, Madame Vion had unfettered access to Caen and the surrounding area. She used this access to pass information to agents who were based in Caen. Information that the trigger mechanism was being housed in the pillbox at the bridge was delivered via Madame Vion. But the source of this was actually Therese Gondry. Therese was raised in Alsace and spoke fluent German. She'd overheard the Germans talking in her cafe about the trigger in the pillbox, and at great risk to herself and to her family, she'd passed this information on to the French resistance via Madame Vion. This information was revealed to Howard just days before the assault. The bridge garrison was made up of soldiers from the 716th Infantry Division. This was a static division assigned to guard Hitler's Atlantic Wall on the Calvados coast. One particular member of the garrison at Pegasus Bridge was Helmut Romer an 18-year-old private in the 736th Grenadier Regiment. Howard would find himself as a sentry on the bridge in the first few minutes of D-Day on the 6th of June. Shortly before 11pm, on what was still the 5th of June, the six gliders took off from Tarrant Rushton. Each one would be towed by a single Halifax bomber. Setting off in one minute intervals, the gliders would be towed to the French coast. As they approached the targets, the glider pilots would release the towing cables, which would begin the start of their descent. The gliders were split into two groups. One group was designated to land in landing zone X for Pegasus, and the other at landing zone Y for Horsa. The lead glider for landing zone X was flown by Staff Sergeant Jim Warwick. On board was Major Howard and Lieutenant Brovage's platoon. Prior to takeoff, Howard asked Warwick to use the nose of the glider to break the German wire. Feet up! Hang on! Jim Warwick kept his promise. Today, three monuments stand where each of the gliders landed, testament to the skill and their bravery. Major Howard, I cannot overestimate the importance of your task. 
The Orn River Bridge must be captured before the enemy can destroy it. This bridge is a vital military artery, and the enemy has prepared it for demolition. It must be taken by surprise and captured intact. Your gliders will land at night without the benefit of ground support. You will assault the garrison, overwhelm it, and hold until relieved. Hold until relieved. From this perspective, we can see just how close Jim Warwick's glider landed to the bridge. Although on target, Glider 3 landed very heavy and split on landing. Lance Corporal Greenhog was thrown unconscious into the pond and tragically died. The men in Glider 1 were dazed but quickly gained their composure. They had landed right where they wanted to be and achieved complete surprise. Lieutenant Brovage's platoon was tasked with neutralising the pillbox and then charge over the bridge to neutralise the Germans on the western side. On the bridge, Roma would be horrified to see Brovage's men charging towards him. Up the action back! The action back! Roma would turn and flee, along with two others. They would hide 100 metres from the bridge alongside the canal and play no further part in tonight's battle. They would stay there for two days, eventually giving themselves up. Tired, thirsty and hungry, they decided to take a chance. They would either be captured or shot. They were taken prisoner and Roma would spend the rest of the war in England and Canada. Brovage and his men charged across the bridge the German sentry stopped, took out a pistol flare, fired into the air. Brovridge cut him down with his stun gun. To his right, a machine gun opened fire. Brovridge pulled a grenade from his pouch and threw it at the gun pit. In that second, Brovridge was hit and fell to the ground. Once the German positions were neutralised on the west side of the bridge, the men were to rendezvous with Lieutenant Brovridge outside the cafe. Wally Parr ran around the cafe, shouting, Where's Danny? Where's Danny? To his face, he was Mr. Brovridge, but to the men, he was Danny. Then Brovridge had a gunshot wound to the neck and would die shortly afterwards from his wounds. His wife Margaret was expecting their first child. In the nearby town of Ronville, in the civilian cemetery, a number of British and German soldiers are buried here together. One of them is Den Brovridge. Den Brovridge will be the first Allied soldier killed by enemy fire on D-Day. Both sides of the bridge were secure. The engineers had informed Major Howard that the demolition charges had been removed. In less than 15 minutes, they had secured the bridge. With Pegasus secure, Major Howard now waited for news of water. Number 4 glider was taken off course by the tug and landed 8 miles to the east. Number 5 glider landed just short, but number 6 glider landed exactly where they wanted to. Led by Lieutenant Fox, the men of Number 6 Glider quickly overcame the machine gun on the bridge. Horsa Bridge was now secure. With both bridges secure, the greatest threat now came from the west. Major Howard ordered Lieutenant Fox to move his platoon from the river up to the west of Pegasus Bridge. Lieutenant Fox's men took up positions around the town hall. They guarded the important T-junction and the approach to Pegasus Bridge itself. Meanwhile at Beeville, close to Benneville, number one company of the Panzerjäger Abtelung 716 was alerted to the presence of the airborne troop. 
Equipped with four Marder tank destroyers, they were ordered to Pegasus Bridge as a reconnaissance in four. At the T-junction, the men could hear the tanks approaching. Sergeant Wagger Forton readied his PIA. The PIA was the only anti-tank weapon that the men had. It had a short range but could be very effective against enemy armour. Wagger Forton waited with his PIA. In complete darkness, he couldn't see the tank but he could hear the tracks. He waited for the last possible moment. He just said to himself, don't miss. He hit the tank completely side on. A massive explosion ensued. The explosion lit up the darkness. It was described as being like a huge fireworks display. The three remaining tanks retreated, reporting that the British had an anti-tank gun. The immediate threat was now over. Major Howard ordered Corporal Tapperden to send out the success signal. Both bridges secure, ham and jam, ham and jam. Although the bridges were secure, Major Howard knew that a greater danger loomed near. The British had learned that Rommel had placed 21st Panzer Division very close to the city of Caen. An attack by the 21st Panzer Division against their positions at Benouville was expected. Howard's men would now await the arrival of 7 Parachute Battalion, who would shortly be landing at the drop zone just north of Romville. With the arrival of 7 Para, Howard's men would move to the rear and act as a reserve. 7 Para would occupy the positions at Laporte and Benneville. Arriving with 7 Para, was Lieutenant Richard Todd. Todd would take up positions behind B Company in Laporte. Todd would return to acting after the war, and famously, he would portray Major Howard in the film The Longest Day. Seven Power and Howard's men were still in a precarious position. They had come under repeated attacks from German infantry and tanks in an effort to dislodge them from the bridges. Relief would come from 3rd Infantry moving inland towards Caen, and also the Special Service Brigade commandos who were tasked with moving to the east of the bridgehead. Alongside Lord Lovett was Piper Bill Millin. His pipes would be a pre-arranged signal to inform the airborne that the commandos had arrived. 